Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for spending an hour of your Friday afternoon with us. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the Belonging Project. Uh, the Belonging Project is a national collaborative effort of more than 25 national industry partners that supports and builds community among diverse law students, attorneys, and their allies to combat the impact of COVID-19 on diversity in the legal profession. The project provides tools, resources, and programs to support the continuing personal and professional development of diverse legal talent. To inclusion and diversity in the profession, the Belonging Project brings the power of Ubuntu that our humanity derives from the humanity of the collective. Mm. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Deborah Snyder, who is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Greenberg Torrent. In her role, she works closely with the firm's Chief Diversity Officer and members of a cross-functional team dedicated to implementing the firm's robust diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies and initiatives, including client and community collaborations. Previously, Deborah practiced law for more than 18 years at Alston and Bird, including as a partner in the firm's litigation and products liability practice groups. She also served on various firm-wide committees focused on hiring, mentoring, and retention of diverse attorneys and co-chaired the Atlanta Office Diversity Committee. Welcome, Deborah, and the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Sin. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon to everyone. As Sin just said, thank you for spending some time with us on a Friday afternoon. Um, my name is Deborah Sidnor, and I am thrilled to be here with you today. Um, first and foremost, we want to say thank you to Corey um, and the entire Safe Barth Shaw team for both giving us this opportunity to share today, as well as for creating this belonging project, which is um, incredible for the legal profession, for diverse students and diverse attorneys. So thank you so much. Um, Today, as you know, we're here to talk about cultural competence as a leadership skill and a leadership trait. And I'll start off because I thought this was so timely. I woke up this morning with a text from a friend. It had a meme attached and the meme read, today marks five years that we've been in 2020. <laughs> and um, I chuckled just like you guys, only and Giselle, and I, because it's one, it's so true. Um, but it, it made me think about our topic today because the reality of it is that uh, we're exhausted. You know, the, these first um, 11 and a half months of 2020 have literally exhausted, I think, everyone. Um, and so, you know, what's important to keep in mind, though, as leaders within our organizations, um, that you know, our colleagues and our, and our team, the people on our teams, while they have this exhaustion that, that they're carrying around with them, uh, they are still looking to us to be effective leaders, to make sure that uh, we are interacting with them in ways that um, help to drive success for the company, but as well as in ways that, that help to engage them and create meaningful relationships. And, and another thing I'll share um, before we get right into it is that I heard another speaker at a recent conference say that um, today many employees, employees are looking to their corporations and the leaders in their corporations much in the same way that they used to look for the, at the government to provide, um, you know, a sense of, uh, you know, leadership in crises. Um, but whereas now they're really looking to their leaders in the corporation for that, for that leadership um, and to, you know, to really give them a sense of comfort and safety, quite frankly. And so again, this is such an important topic, so I'm glad that we're able to bring it forward today. Um, before we, I introduce the panel and let them introduce themselves, I do want to let the attendees know that we will uh, reserve some time at the end of our discussion to take um, questions and to hopefully answer any questions. So. Um, Hopefully, you'll have some to share with us. So first, I will just introduce our esteemed panel by name and title. I feel like I won the lottery because these three women were the three that came to mind when I was um, invited to do this, and they all said yes without me having to bribe them. So. Uh, First, we have Faith Knight Myers. Faith is the Global Privacy Officer and Vice President for McKesson Corporation. 
we have Oni Holly Brown, and Oni serves as the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel, Chief Litigation Officer for Aviana Healthcare. And lastly, we have Giselle Calanzo Douglas, and Giselle is the General Counsel and Director of Business Affairs for Bethel Gospel Assembly, Inc. Um, so, ladies, first I will ask for you to maybe tell our, uh, our guests a little bit more about your role within your organization before we get started. And I'll start perhaps, I'm look, the way it's set up on my screen, I'll start with you, Faith. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. It is certainly a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. My name is Faith Knight Myers, and I have the pleasure of leading the privacy office at McKesson which is a healthcare services company. And in most cases, we provide services to other businesses. So we're not really consumer facing. So we're a big company that like most people have never heard of, which we joke about. <laughs> um, I oversee the privacy, legal and compliance functions for the company at the state, federal and international level. Um, I've been at McKesson for about 13 years, but in the legal profession for about 24. Um, I lead a team of about 14 people um, and have always had a passion for diversity and inclusion. So I'm really happy to be on this panel. Thank you, Faith. Oni, you're up. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be part of this conversation and very, very energized by what's going on, even though these have been some very trying times lately. I think this is an opportunity to move in the right direction in a lot of ways. Uh, as Deborah said, I am Deputy General Counsel and Chief Litigation Officer for Aviana Healthcare. We're a national company in the business of providing pediatric and adult home care and behavioral therapy services. My role at the company is to manage the litigation and risk management function for the company, in addition to providing counsel and support to our operations uh, in clinical teams. I supervise a team of 10 people. Uh, we are a leanly staffed legal department, which means that even though we have job descriptions, we pretty much do everything. We, we like to call ourselves the, the professional fixers <laughs> of the organization because we are the people that get the phone call when there's some difficult issue uh, and you need someone to parachute in to uh, manage the crisis and solve the problem. Our company is in the, its infancy in terms of uh, developing its diversity and inclusion program, and we can go, go more into that later. Uh, but I'm very excited about uh, what's happening and looking forward to today's conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Oni. It's nice to have a fixer on the panel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Giselle. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, Deborah. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this great conversation with Faith and Oni and all of the participants who are going to join in. Um, I currently serve as general counsel and director of business affairs for Bethel Gospel Assembly, Inc. in New York City. Uh, the parent organization is a church. However, we have um, affiliate and subsidiary companies and a very uh, robust real estate portfolio. So I serve um, as an overseer of all of those things that are of national as well as international interest. I've been a practicing attorney for about 15 years. I think that the conversation is very timely and apropos to world events and changes, and I look forward to a great dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. Awesome. All right, so we're going to jump right in, ladies. Um, First question we'll, we'll, I'll pose to you first is um, just about cultural competency generally. You know, generally speaking, it's often believed or talked about as um, one's ability to interact effectively with people from different cultures, backgrounds, walks of life, beliefs, attitudes, et cetera. So, um, and I will pose this question to each of you is how does cultural competence and the discussions around this topic show up um, in your workplace? And to add a finer point to it, again, recognizing that 2020 um, has been unique, to say the least, um, share with us if it's, if, what the impact of 2020 has been on discussions of cultural competence in your workplace, if any at all, if there has been an impact or a shift. Um, Giselle, I know since uh, I'm going to start with you because I just think the the perspective you bring is uh, is very unique to it. So 
I'm going to start with you. Thank you. So cultural competence as a phrase or nomenclature is not something that we use across the organization. Um, I think all of us are becoming more awakened to some of the terminology that we need to use as we engage on, you know, in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, but our organization, just by its very makeup, because it's international in scope, um, just functioned in a way that needed to be aware and sensitive to different cultural um, perspectives. So across our portfolio of not only ministries, but endeavors, we have uh, a school in South Africa, we have um, programs uh, in Albania, in India, South and Central America, in the Caribbean. And so it was always kind of intrinsic in the work that we did that we considered the cultural, um, the cultural ramifications, the cultural perspective that our work would bring. Um, I actually have a, I remember one time we went to Azerbaijan. I'd never even heard of Azerbaijan. But as we prepared for it, we were going into this country that was near Iran, Christian-based organization. And we really had to talk about internally as we prepare for this, you know, how we needed to interact with the people, being aware of, you know, the different cultural background, even proper attire as we went into that space. And so that's the way that we've actually um, always kind of positioned ourselves as we navigated uh, throughout our work and our endeavors. And um, one of the things that was a marked point for us, though, because um, we're primarily an African American organization, but um, early 2000s, late 90s, there was really a shift um, in the community, uh, Bethel Gospel Assembly, situated in Harlem, New York. Um, and around that same time, and I know it happened across various communities, um, you know, gentrification started to happen. And so our neighbors didn't necessarily look like what had been, you know, generally the norm, quote unquote. And so we really had these different these stakeholders from different racial and ethnic backgrounds that um, because of our community engagement piece, we had to deal with. And so we had to once again kind of, um, I guess, adjust to how we navigated this new dynamic uh, and making sure that um, though the words cultural competence were not necessarily uttered, that we operated from this framework of understanding and being sensitive to cultural differences and perspectives. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think what I always found so unique about what you shared is that being with an organization that's predominantly African American, you know, we sometimes don't think that our, that those types of organizations have to still deal with the same issues and questions. So that's why I'm so excited and thankful that you shared that. Um, Oni, I'll jump to you because as you mentioned in your introduction, your company is kind of in the infancy as it relates to um, the, this space, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what can you share with us about um, kind of maybe how it's showing up now in your organization? Sure. As I mentioned before, uh, you know, the company provides home care services and, and therapy services, and we operate in 30 states and we continue to grow. Uh, interestingly enough, our workforce is very diverse, and I, I think that's it's a bit of an organic thing for us. There wasn't a structured program or focus on diversity. And I, I think that organic diversity was driven by industry and geography because we operate in major cities and we operate in rural remote areas too. So you, you got a very cross, uh, an interesting cross mix of people uh, that are drawn to the healthcare industry uh, in those different localities. A cultural competency was also not a term that, that we used as a company uh, but it was something that was happening anyway. I think as a woman of color that people of color in general are used to having to navigate cultures that are someone else's, you know, simply because of the spaces in which we operate. So I think there's a natural sensitivity to people of different cultures and different backgrounds because of that. One of the biggest impacts of 2020 has been that our leadership, which is not very diverse, has had to get well-versed in cultural competence in response to the changes that are happening in this country, uh, diversity of the workforce, and frankly, the demand uh, that there be more intention around inclusion efforts. 
And so there, there's been a, a shift uh, because of that, because of that demand, because of that need being more articulated now because of what's, what's been happening in, in this country. And now there is uh, more intention around diversity efforts. We just hired a vice president of diversity and inclusion. Very excited to be working with her. Um, Congratulations. Yes, yeah, we're really excited about that. Uh, we're working with her to develop a strategic plan and form a committee to focus on diversity and inclusion and uh, bring more intention uh, to the effort and serve the diverse, diverse workforce we've been fortunate enough to have, you know? That's great. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing that. I feel like I'm getting feedback. I apologize if I am. Um, Faith, and can you just uh, talk to us briefly about McKesson and, term, and, and the, the idea or the conversations around cultural competence in, at McKesson? Sure, yeah. So we we also we did not refer to the term cultural competency. We defer to diversity and inclusion. Um, we have been talking about it for a while, really at the employee level. So we have lots of affinity groups. We have affinity groups for black colleagues, for uh, Pan-Asian colleagues, Latino colleagues, LGBTQ colleagues, female colleagues, military, disabled. Um, and we have each of those groups that are sponsored by somebody from the C-suite or a direct report of the C-suite. Um, as of late, though, uh, we've you know, changed the term from diversity and inclusion to inclusion, diversity and culture. So we've gone from DNI to IDC over uh, recent times. And so I think we've it, it's always been a focus, but where it has not been a focus traditionally is at the leadership levels of the organization. And so, you know, I had attended when I had kind of gotten, you know, oh, at a certain level and got to attend some of the, the leadership meetings at the highest levels. You know, I went to the first meeting and there were about 200 people there and I was you know, really excited, like, ah, oh, you know, singing the Jefferson song in the back of my head <laughs> and, um, you know, got there and looked around and there were like two people like me one year there was nobody like me the next year um and it was it was it was very you know it was disheartening and you know when at one point i asked some of the the, the panelists um when we opened for q a you know how, how do we diversify what's on the stage which was the most diversity there were two white women uh, no other diversity i'm like the only way we're going to change that is if we change the demographic of the people in the room and, um, you know, I said, you know, it's obvious at leadership levels. And so I think that has been um, post George Floyd, you know, an acknowledgement by the company is, you know, we, we've done, we've, we've had these activities internally, but we must do more at the mm -hmm. highest leadership levels within the company. Yeah, well, that's, um, yeah, that's, unfortunately, I think that's a, the story that we hear all too often as it relates to who's in the room at these at these high level leadership meetings. And I think one thing all three of you um, have touched upon is this kind of cultural competence wasn't really in our vocabulary, right? Pre 2020. And I will say, I feel like really probably since um, not so much COVID, but the George Floyd killing um, where I'm getting seeing more about cultural competence. It's almost like um, particularly outside consultants really replacing diversity and inclusion with cultural competence. And I don't, I mean, I think that could be a good move. It could be a good pivot because it really, cultural competence really does require us to go beyond diversity in terms of representation and numbers. It really requires us to focus on um, a culture of inclusion and belonging, as you were just saying, Faith. And, and to get, you know, to that point of really having a sustainable culture of inclusion and belonging. It requires a lot of kind of work individually, a lot of inward reflection. And so I want to um, jump into a, our next question, which is uh, what role has your own self-awareness played in your journey to be more culturally competent? Um, Oni, I think I'll start with you with that question. Sure. You know, I think that uh, self-awareness is a key part of it. Uh, I think that you definitely have to be mindful uh, when you're having uh, interpersonal interactions with, a, with someone else. Uh, and 
a personal lesson for me is to be more conscious about how I am perceived or how I come across. I, I not in my current role, but in the uh, in-house role I had prior to to this one. I had a situation with a female colleague who's also African American. She was not one of my direct reports, but uh, she was in our human resources department at, at my former company. And we had to interact a lot because I dealt with uh, the employment issues for the company. That was part of my job and uh, that assistant general counsel uh, position I held at the time. And there was a, a situation that had come up where she frankly had not done her job and, and it caused an issue uh, that created some exposure for the company. And it was a circumstance that probably would have been defensible had she done her part. And I found, my, found myself having to have the uncomfortable conversation with her where I had to explain what she had done incorrectly. And you know, as as a, a lawyer, you know, I'm used to talking mostly to other lawyers or operations people who aren't particularly sensitive, you know, and I I can honestly say that I didn't have a full appreciation of her perspective or background when we had the conversation. And I was very polite. Um and I, I tried to do it in a, you know in a very um sit, bring some sensitivity to it and, mm -hmm. and not hurt her feelings. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, she perceived me as being uh, aggressive toward her. Uh, and she was very upset about it to the point of tears. Mm -hmm. And I had had to have a conversation with her manager because her manager came to me and said, well, you know, this person was very upset after that conversation. She was in tears. Uh, she thought, you know, you were being overly aggressive. And I, I was surprised by that, frankly. Uh, so what that taught me was that I needed to bring a, a higher level of, of sensitivity and mindfulness in those interactions because, you know, just because I'm used to, to functioning in a certain environment with a certain group, mainly lawyers, it doesn't mean that that's uh, the way to to interact with people from different backgrounds who are used to being in different environments. So just bringing that mindfulness to the exercise, who, mm -hmm. who are you speaking with? You know, give yeah. consideration to their background, their experiences and, and what their views might be uh, when you're having interactions. Absolutely. And, and Faith, I'll come to you. I mean, as Oni said, I mean, being self-aware really is step one, okay. you know, in terms of developing cultural competence as a leader. So can you share a little bit with us about kind of how that has uh, come about for you? What's been your journey? Definitely. And so, you know, I think that just leadership and management and, you know, growth is like, it's like any other skill that you need to sharpen as time goes on. And so, you know, there's a thought that, you know, once you've reached a certain level or you've been working at a certain period of time, boom, you're ready to manage other people. And that may be true and that may not be true. Um, there's an assumption that, you know, length of time and length of service equals a good manager. And that is just not the case. And like any other skill, any other substantive skill where you get CLEs to keep your skills up or any kind of continuing legal education, I think management and leadership is another one of those skills that you, you know, that you I constantly take, um, you know, training and classes and seminars every year to increase that skill and to use the skills on a daily basis. So I don't think it's something that you can just, um, you know, you can just kind of assume I I'm culturally competent and I got this. I think in general, leadership and management requires practice, growth, continual education, learning, um, just like any other skill set. You have to, you know, kind of sharpen that. And I think if you sharpen yourself as a leader and a manager, like that cultural competency, kind of it blends right in. Mm hmm. Great point. Giselle? Do you want to share with us maybe how um, uh, your your role or how you view self awareness, how that's come about for you in terms of developing cu cultural competence? I'll say this is feels like a CLE for me with all the brilliance <laughs> that's being shared right here. <laughs> <laughs> What's the faith and only? I'm like I want to take notes myself. 
I'm you. taking copious notes. Yes, I'll share. share, share. <laughs> um, so for me, if this is the, the perspective that I bring to this. Um, I'm originally from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I was born and lived there until I was 11 years old. Came to the States. English was not my first language. So I had to really um, you know, learn a whole new culture. You know, when I was leaving, this guy that worked for my family told me, you know, when you get to America, every street is paved with, in gold, you know? So I had these expectations and then we landed and moved to the Bronx and I was like, okay, this is not <laughs> paved with gold. Um, but then you go through, especially when you're that young, you go through this phase where you want to belong so well. And it's apropos that this is the belonging uh, conversation. You want to belong, uh, but the way that that, played out for me is that I wanted to kind of lose all of the things that had been my makeup. I wanted, you know, I had this strong accent, so I wanted to sound more American. And so we were learning how to speak English, watching like Dallas Dynasty and Dukes of Hazzard, if you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would go to school, wanted to, you know, just wanted to assimilate a little bit more because I was being asked questions like, did you have elephants in your backyard? Did you swim from trees? Like, you know, all these questions, because people didn't really have a, a really good gauge about what the whole of Africa was about. Um, right. So I spent a really long time focused on acculturation and focused on assimilation. Um, and so during the course of that, and I think well into my adulthood and professional experiences, um, I didn't take into account my own cultural uh, background and how it could actually enrich uh, the work that I did, um, because I had spent so much time kind of trying to get away with, from it. Um, mm -hmm. Until last year, um, 2019, I went back to the Congo for the first time in 30 plus years. And that was such a life changing moment for me in so many ways, um, not only like reconnecting with family, but really getting um, first hand re reconnection and remembrance of who I am and why I kind of operate a certain way that a lot of who I am is rooted in my culture. And so that really brought such an awareness to me as I deal with other people, especially those who come from different places and being more sensitive to that, that, you know, they present a certain a way maybe because background or, you know, it can even be just community that people come from. And so how all of that shapes, you know, how we think and how we, you know, how we present ourselves, even in interviews. I think I, I watched something where, you know, someone from uh, a particular cultural background was being interviewed, but because, um, you know, she was kind of like eyes, you know, down, not necessarily giving eye contact and talking to the people who are interviewing, how they interpreted that as if it was, you know, she wasn't confident and she was me, but really it was, a, you know, part of her culture to kind of have that kind of like deference and demeanor. Mm -hmm. um, so just going back and, 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 you know, the way that that played out for myself personally and the reconnection really um, touched me in such a way that I'm much more cognizant of the role that cultural background plays and much more sensitive to it as I deal with different people across my right. work space. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that, especially that very personal story. Um, you know, what I hear from all of you is it's almost like we have to do our own, like, uh, I want to call it a counseling session, right? You've got to, you've got to become more self-aware because we all have biases. We all have stuff, right, internally. And if we're going to be effective leaders, as, as Oni and Faith and you, Giselle, have all shared, that step one is really doing that self-awareness, do the work. You know, determine what are what are my biases, what are my own um, preferences, and, and understand them. Don't run away from them, right? But just accept them. They are what they are. Um, because at some point, it's all about learning how to dialogue across these differences, and you got to know what the differences are to have that dialogue. And so, um, I want to turn a little bit, actually, kind of playing off of that a little bit. It's also important, I believe, as leaders for us to create safe spaces for our colleagues to share, to grow, to challenge us, um, you know, to really be able to bring their full selves to the work. And, you know, again, there we are again with 2020, really uh, bringing this to the forefront because people are bringing um, different um, perspectives on politics, on you know, social issues, et cetera, not necessarily into the office since we're still, you know, in this work from home environment, but just 
with them. It shows up with them. And so um, talk to us a little bit about this importance of, you know, why is it important to create safe spaces and maybe how you all go about doing it, how you, your companies go about doing it and other leaders within your companies. Um, and I don't know, Faith, maybe we'll come to you first to talk a little bit about the safe spaces. Yeah. So, you know, we I think, you know, creating safe spaces is really important. And I think the tone has to really come from the top um, to, to so that the CEO all the way down, you know, encourages their leaders and their direct reports. And that flows down to create safe spaces where people feel like they can really bring their authentic selves to work. And, mm -hmm. you know, post George Floyd, I, you know, reached out to my general counsel and I said, I think you really need to create an environment where people can, you know, just say how they're feeling um, to create some awareness and let people know that, hey, we hear you, we acknowledge you. And as part of that, I said, okay, I'll go first, you know, on our department call of 300, 400 people. And I said, you know, one, I'm tired. Just like you started the conversation, Deborah, I I'm tired. Um, you know, this is not new, um, but finally I feel like I can at least exhale and I can say, okay, now does the rest of the country and the world see what we've been seeing? Do you, do you see us now? Um, and I shared some experiences, you know, growing up as a, as a professional black woman and walking into, to maybe a Gucci store and, and being ignored or going mm. into the dollar store and being followed or having my daughter, you know, in the stroll. And I'm like, don't touch anything anything when we're in the <laughs> store because if something happens even a mistake right. you will not and i will not get the benefit of the doubt right. and so when i shared these things on the call a lot of my white colleagues after the call reached out to me and said you know thank you because hearing it from you someone that i know that hit me a little differently i i i knew but i, I didn't really know and so I think creating these safe spaces allows us to share with colleagues and influence them in a way that maybe they hadn't been before. And if I didn't feel safe enough to express that then, some of those sort of realizations would have never happened. And so I think throughout the company, leaders in different departments have just created safe spaces, whether it's in a big forum and somebody may not want to disclose in a, in, a, in a on a call with 400 people and we've created right. smaller forums where they're like 12 um so and anonymous forums where people in whatever way is comfortable for you you can at least express how you feel right and it's great i mean you're right it starts from the top um and and leaders have to be willing to take those risks to speak out you know they can't shy away from it either um uh, what about with you oni how what do you have to say about this idea of the importance of creating safe spaces and maybe how that's um, how you or other leaders within your company are looking to do that? I think safe spaces are critical uh, to any effort toward inclusion, equity and, and belonging. You know, I like something that Faith said earlier and I may be getting the order wrong, but uh, you were saying that you know, you, you sort of took diversity and put it a little bit further down and, and you focus more on inclusion and equity. And, you know, I think that that has become a movement uh, because of what's been happening in 2020. You know, for myself, for the people that I know and my family and my social circle of friends and professional colleagues, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and I could go on and on, were names that we've been speaking for a long time, conversations that we've been having among ourselves. But those conversations about those individuals and, and the things that have happened to them and the efforts to seek justice for them were not conversations that were happening, happening at a, a corporate level. And one of the responses to those events was the creation of what we have been calling up to this point is an Aviana Black Lives Matter discussion group. And that is a safe space for anyone in the company to come together uh, in, a, in a forum. It's a moderated forum where employees can voluntarily participate and come together and talk about what they're thinking and feeling. And it's a safe space where people aren't judged, where anybody can come and express what they're thinking 
ask the uncomfortable or they may think of as silly questions uh, because they're they're not aware. You know, as, as Faith was saying, you know, she had colleagues who came up and said, you know, I, I didn't get it. I didn't understand uh, the response to George Floyd's murder or Breonna Taylor's murder until I heard from you, somebody that I know, somebody whose experience I personalized. And I think having people come together to be able to have open discussions is a way to humanize someone else's experience. So it is not just a headline in a newspaper or the news feed on your iPhone. It mm-hmm. becomes more personal and more relatable when you hear it from somebody that you know, that you work with alongside on a daily basis. But I think the safe spaces also go both ways. It is an opportunity for people of color who are used to functioning in cultural environments that they did not create uh, to bring their authentic selves uh, to work and to feel seen and feel heard uh, in a way that probably hasn't taken place before now. It's also an opportunity for, for colleagues who are not people of color to come and ask questions, to fully appreciate and hear from people uh, that they may not interact with outside of work about what they might be thinking and feeling about what's going on in this country that belongs to all of us, that we are all a part of. And that's that's why I think it's important. And I do think that that has to be a top-down effort. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Giselle, you want to share something on this? Yeah, so for us, as I said before, we're a predominantly African American organization. So um, definitely the, the the bishop and CEO top you know top down made it clear in terms of what our position was, and because of our community engagement, you know that this is um, the, the what was happening in 2020 was important, and we needed to take you know an active role in making sure that you know our voices were heard across you know the community. But the way that it happened for me is that as part of my role at Bethel, I sit on two boards that are not as diverse as the organization for which I directly work. And so in one, on one board, I had the, um, the chairman come to me directly. He's um, Caucasian and wanted to talk to me privately about what was happening, similar to what only just referenced and had questions and wanted to hear about my experience. So I shared a lot of different things for, for myself, for my husband, my son, you know, being married to a, a, a black man, raising a black son, how all of those mm-hmm. things were playing out for me and the emotions that I had. And we had, you know, what I call the courageous conversation. It definitely wasn't comfortable. Uh, and I know that by the way that, as, um, you know, as a lawyer, we speak, we can speak very firmly. Um, okay. You know, I, was, I, didn't, I didn't beat around the bush, you know, I, I told him what it was. And so it was a difficult conversation, but I appreciated the initiative that he took to want to hear what I had to say and bring to the table. Um, mm-hmm. The other board that I sit on, they were a little less aware of the moment. Um, and, and I feel like I had to create the space to be able to address the issues. Because we were sitting there and I'm waiting for it to be brought up. I mean, it's, things are playing out on the news, or like just no mention of it. And, you know, they're sending out documents for review. And I'm like, no, it's Juneteenth. I'm not doing this, you know? Right. <laughs> I'm like, Do I it's a this holiday. <laughs> I'm not doing this. Um, and then certain conversations that I had to just bring to the forefront. And it, it was, I've gotten to know them over the years. So I, I, I'm trusting that it was just a lack of, because it, it was, there's no personal impact, right? Mm. And so sometimes when it's not in your house, you're not as, invested kind of thing so i had to bring it to the front door and say no this is impacting and this was in the realm of our um of our real estate and a lot of our staff was was deemed they were deemed essential employees they had to come to work in the middle of a pandemic one and in the middle of protests and so i had to talk to them about what this looks like you know to make sure that they were protected like to make sure they have you know proper documentation that they're supposed to be out because most of our staff is black and brown and it's something that just was not part of their thought process Mm -hmm. um, because they just could not relate to it. So in one place, um, I was invited or the the safe space was created to have the conversation. And in another place, I had to kind of 
you know, mm-hmm. around me, I create the space to be able to have the discussion because I don't think someone, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot who just said it, that it's, it's an issue for everyone. So no right. one can really bury their head in the sand. Everyone has to have the conversation and the discussion if we're going to move forward in any way that's meaningful. Absolutely. I love that. And I think um, it was only to just share that it's it's a two way street. Right. And I think that is so important for everyone to remember, um, because, you know, speaking, obviously, as a black woman, we, we feel that pressure and that burden and that frustration that I think is totally understandable when people come to us for, you know, ex- explanation and you just want to say, listen, Google it. Okay, Google it. Um, but at the same time, you know, it does, it, 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 it makes you have to take a pause, do a wusa moment, and, and see is this an opportunity to your point, Giselle? You know, what, how can I create an opening here? You know, how can I create an opportunity for someone to, um, to ask me a question? And, and, you know, and how can I take my own t- internal temperature down a little bit to address it? And one thing is you all were just sharing it. I just thought about this just happened today um, within my firm. Uh, you know, we always talk about courageous conversations, right? Everyone's doing those, which are great, um, but they do take a lot of planning, a lot of work. And so I do think sometimes there are even simple, uh, less time-consuming actions that leaders can take that help both, um, you know, Put, uh, create self-awareness opportunities for others, as well as it expands knowledge. And um, what I'm referring to, one of our senior leaders today sent a firm-wide email, U.S. offices, global offices as well, um, acknowledging uh, Diwali this weekend is a you know big celebration in India. And again, and here and again, self-awareness. I know one of my uh, weak areas is as it relates to other religions and understanding other cultures. And so he sent this really great email talking about the significance of it. And as I now understand it, it's, you know, as a Christian, um, they see it, it's like their Christmas, right? So that I can relate to. He said, it's like Christmas. I'm like, whoa, this, okay, we, this is important. I get it. But I do think, you know, as I reflected on it and looked at his email and then he he followed it up with a response that he had received from another colleague thanking him for sharing it. And, um, you know, as he said, and I think I wrote it down because I thought, wow, this is this is good stuff. Um, But he said that, you know, trust and collaboration happen most among people who know each other better. And I was like, okay, you know, that was one of my aha moments for the day. But it, I, I just thought, you know what, well, he's right. And again, as leaders, sometimes it's those small things that, you know, be aware of other cultures and other celebrations and share that information with others. Because in him doing that, I could, you know, you could almost just collectively sense throughout our company, people felt like, yeah, you know, we're more alike than we're different. We have so much in common than we don't. And so that was just something that, um, you know, I wanted to actually add as well to this conversation because, again, I think, you know, we, we have to find ways of, of uh, you know, bringing increasing knowledge, not just of ourselves, but for others as well. Um, another question, and I'm keeping my eye on the time. I think we're doing pretty good. Um, when we talk about these safe spaces and this two-way street, it naturally t- leads to this question of empathy, right? And we know that... Um, Empathy is really key to developing cultural competence. You know, if you want to be an effective leader, you have absolutely have to have empathy. And so I'm just wondering, I'll throw it out there and maybe one of you raise your hand if you tell me you, you want to, um, you have a, something to share about it. But um, can you share a positive story or experience of how you or other leaders in your company have demonstrated empathy during this very unique time that we're in right now? Anybody? Sure, right. I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, okay. Go for it, Faith. So, you know, just on your last point, one of the things that we just did at McKesson in terms of, you know, small steps is, you know, we have a bank of company holidays, Thanksgiving, the day after Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, et cetera. And so what we've done is they've taken some of those ho- some of those standard holidays and made them floating holidays to an, an acknowledgement that people celebrate at different times of the year. It may not be the day after Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving for you, it may be another time. And so some of those company holidays 
were taken, thrown into a bank. So there's still the same number of days off, but you get to pick as an employee which days that you mm. want. Um, as opposed to the days that are right. set by the company. And I thought that was a really nice, um, nice step. Absolutely. Um, but in terms of empathy, one of, you know, I mentioned that we have affinity groups at McKesson and the executive sponsor of our black affinity group is a white Caucasian male who's the CFO of the company. And maybe a day or two after George Floyd, he sent out an email to all of the members of the black affinity group that we didn't know, we didn't have no idea was coming. And it basically said, hey, one, we recognize the horrible, tragic, you know, unjustified events of George Floyd and, and in really strong terms. And also we acknowledge that in addition to this, that your community has been harder hit by the COVID crisis. Mm. And both of these things, we acknowledge it and we stand with you. And that did so much to just acknowledge, you know, that these incidents were horrible because, you know, sometimes when incidents happen, they're alleged and, you know, people right. are very cautious in terms of how they are described. Um, right. But his, his, his description was very firm. Um, and then to acknowledge the COVID crisis in light of the Black community, it, it was very meaningful. And we felt like you hear us, you understand, and you're, you're standing with us. And so it was just an email, but I can tell you how many of us uh, Black employees talk, spoke amongst each other and how comforting it was just to get that. Absolutely. Yeah, just you sharing it just now, I kind of felt a little tear <laughs> well enough. Like, okay, that's, that's great. And that, that certainly is an example of a leader being, being a leader. Um, anyone else before Oni or Giselle? Yeah, I see you raising your finger like you're in church, Oni. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 empathy is is that's the way that we we bridge the gra gaps and and develop that common ground right that allows us to to develop the trust that's necessary uh, for us to fully appreciate each other and see each other and I think probably the most positive example of empathy uh, that I can think of has been the success of the Black Lives Matter discussion groups I talked about earlier. And it meant a lot to uh, particularly the African-American employees that the management of our company supported the idea of people being able to come together and talk about what they were feeling because there were a lot of employees who were hurting. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a lot of people who really needed an outlet for some very heavy emotions. And, you know, there were conversations happening among myself and other African-American employees that, you know, other people weren't, other colleagues weren't privy to. And I realized along with a lot of other people that this needed to be a larger discussion. Now, you know, I, it's not an idea that I, I can take credit for. Uh, it was started by two other uh, employees, one African-American and one Caucasian male, uh, who was very empathetic because uh, his wife is African-American and he's raising a, a biracial son. Uh, so he was particularly aware of how people were feeling and that was the seed for this idea but the response has been overwhelming with the connection being made by some of our Caucasian colleagues who knew that what happened to George Floyd or, or Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery was tragic, but didn't understand fully why it was impacting African-Americans the way that it was. And why even I would use a term like murder to describe what happened to those individuals. But having that space, having people share really created the kind of awareness and connection, I think, uh, that made it a success, you know, because then that, that opened the door for that empathy to develop. It's like, wow, you know, this person that I, I know and that I have some professional regard for or care about is hurting and I see it now. Right. And then the, the folks who were hurting felt seen and heard, you know, so it was a win for everybody. Absolutely. Okay. 
Ms. Al, did you want me to come to you? And then just quickly, I know that we yeah. uh, we have to watch the time. So um, even though I generally have one a person who kind of oversees staff for me and then, you know, reports up, what I did do uh, just that human element is so important. I actually made sure, especially during the time where New York was so heavily hit by COVID, mm -hmm. I would text the staff directly. And mm -hmm. some of them shared really personal things that were go that they were going through. So one of the things that we did, especially if they have family members that were ill, that had been impacted by COVID, is that we, we sent flowers to that relative on behalf of the employee. And that was something mm -hmm. that I saw across the board change, even the dynamic of all the staff. And they really, I think, felt supported and it was duplicated across other departments. So that was something that I was proud that we were able to do. Oh, absolutely. That's that's great. Uh, I love that. And to make it from that employee, right? I mean, so you're kind of, you're taking some, a load, a burden off of them as well as providing something for someone else. That's amazing. That's great. Um, we are running short on time. So I'm going to ask this one last question and then we'll open it up to see if there's any um, Q&A for us. So, what do you see as the biggest challenge or challenges to promoting cultural competence in our organizations or in the legal profession? Um, let's see who's Giselle. You just spoke. So I'm going to come yeah. back to you last. I'll start okay. back over here with Faith. <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, this is going to be a sustained effort. It's going to take time. And, you know, I yeah. mentioned, you know, it, it's, took 400 years for us to get here. It won't take four to get us in, in a better place. It's going to take a long time. And so that sustained effort and recognizing that, you know, hopefully it won't take us 400 years, but we, you know, we don't have that a, faith. We don't have it. Right, exactly. <laughs> but it will be a sustained effort and for yes. people to kind of keep their foot on the gas to mm -hmm. ensure that we, we continue this sustained effort, not just for today, but on a go forward basis as well. So, you know, just recognizing we're in this for the long haul and there are quick changes that we can make, but there are lasting changes that we need to make that are going to take time. Absolutely. Oni, challenges that you see. Oh, I completely agree with Faith. I think there needs to be recognition that this is a marathon and not a sprint mm. uh, and that we have to recognize that, you know, this is, this is long-term work, uh, and there needs to be an investment of people and resources consistently to reflect that. And I think mm -hmm. I think that's probably uh, one of the biggest challenges is sufficient allocation of resources, because it is a sustained effort. You know, this is just a line item you can put in your budget one year. I think it it has to gradually expand and be supported because the effort is going to expand. And I think there has to be a long-term investment because things are not going to change overnight or right. even in four years. Um, so I think there has to be that consistent commitment. Okay, Giselle. Um, so I think just people themselves can be an impediment to the work being accomplished. If we are resistant to change if those that have been the beneficiaries of, you know, mm -hmm. systems are, 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 you know, are resistant to it, that's going to be a problem. So it has to be that everyone's just open-minded and authentically invested in making sure that there's this shift and that it is longstanding and it is sustained over time and that resources are allocated. Everything that's said, you know, that's been said, but really through the people that are going to have to be the conduits of these, this work being done. Right, right. So basically, leaders cannot take their foot off the gas pedal. We've got to keep fighting through it, pushing through. Not a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's not a moment. It's a movement. Um, you know, all the things you all have shared. I yeah, echo all of that a thousand percent. Um, I think we have about five or six minutes left before the top of the hour. I don't know how we're supposed to do Q and A. So should I? Turn it over to someone from SafeArth who may could lead me through that, or are the lines open? Oh, wait, I do see one question. Is this from Core? How do you, let me throw, I do see a question. I'm sorry. How do you approach the intersection of cultural fluency and implicit bias? For example, the aggression comment. I think that was your comment, Oni. Um, 
Or you want to try to take a stab at responding to that question? Well, you know, I think the key to that is is awareness. You know, uh, I think you have to have awareness of how you conduct yourself and also to try to put yourself in the other person's shoes and have a deeper appreciation of their experience and where they may be coming from. You know, so it, it's, and I'm not going to pretend like that's an easy thing to navigate, but, you know, I think sometimes you have to be very honest with yourself about your own biases and how they may be brought to bear. You know, they call, they, they call them unconscious biases for a reason. So <laughs> I think it's, you know, Deborah, it's to the point that you made, which you, you have to do a self inventory mm -hmm. uh, and think about, you know, how your perceptions and your experience may dictate how you respond to certain situations. And, you know, one of the things that I've worked on is to get away from what I call knee jerk reactions. You know, sometimes you need to take a beat. Uh, and, and kind of align yourself before you jump into action, you know, and that gives you time to think, you know, okay, you know, how, how, what's happening here, you know, and you can step back and say, you know, what is the appropriate response in this situation that gives you a time to look at it from your own perspective, as well as the other person's perspective mm -hmm. before you react. Yeah. That's a great, that's all great, great advice. <laughs> great advice. Um, let's see, let me scroll through. I see a comment, not necessarily a question, but I do want to read it. It says cultural competency has to start at the leadership. Um, what happened? Oh, leadership level. They set the tone and the culture of the organization. Absolutely. Um, I see a question here. It says, I wanted to ask a question regarding open discussions and how to structure them in a way that safe space is maintained? That's a great question, because as we were saying, you know, people have their own, well, I hate to get political, but as we know, 40 something percent of the people have a strong opinion, you know, about certain things that the other half plus of the country don't. And so when you start having these open discussions, um, there is a chance, right, that someone's going to say something that is perhaps um, maybe well-intentioned, maybe not, who knows, but I guess that's the question is how, how do you structure these discussions in a way that maintains some safety uh, for all involved? Does anyone have had the magic pill on that? <laughs> I have a, a magic pill, but you know, I do think that tone comes from the person who is leading the meeting. Um, you know, setting setting forth some ground rules about you know, everybody. This is a time where everybody needs to have some grace, and so you want somebody who unintentionally asks you. You're thinking that's a dumb question, but you want to encourage that person to ask the question to know rather than to assume or have the wrong information. Um, you know, the other thing is that you just want to make sure that the leaders who are having these discussions, it goes back to what I say about, about, about training and education. You want to equip them to be able to have the, those discussions. And if you're not comfortable, reach out to your HR person or a colleague to somebody who is, who can give you some, some tips. Because, we, you know, I know of a leader within our company that had a discussion and according to the people who attended that discussion, that discussion kind of went left and it went very wrong. But the leader was not equipped to get it back on track and didn't realize that she was not equipped to get it back on track. So I think, you know, when you're having the discussion, you need to be thoughtful in advance. There may be some, you know, uh, contrary opinions um, and how do you handle those? But, you know, again, it goes to fundamentally even if you're discussing a, a business a, a business discussion, you need to have you know um, the ability to manage the meeting where you are encouraging constant debate, and you're you're you're, you're uh, you know having healthy debate. You don't always want to have the same opinion on a particular issue, and diversity and inclusion may is one of those topics. So you know you want to have those skills that kind of cut across. Doesn't matter what the topic is, but you can lead both sides where people feel like they can discuss and it's a healthy, it's a healthy environment. And once you have that discussion, you know, you, you have that discussion in that room um, and you, you know, 
you acknowledge that that what happens in that discussion stays in that discussion until you guys, you know, regroup again if that's what you choose to do. Right. Oh, very good points. Uh, there are a couple more questions. I don't know if we'll have time to get to them, but I will. Um, I do want to read this one. I, the last one I see up here. Uh, I believe a huge hindrance of diversity is a lack of orga organizational cultural fluency. How do we differentiate between individual efforts and org organizational change? Those are some big words, Corey. You see, you got me stuttering on these words. That's that's a great question. I mean, that that's like a. I feel like that's a whole another panel too, because uh, you hit the nail on the head, and that's you know, there there is there's there's, there's the cultural competency of the organization and, and how it addresses it and what its values, beliefs, and all of that is. And then you've got the individuals, including the individual leaders, the individual um, you know, people on the teams. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't have the answer to that other than I recognize that that is an issue. It's something that we look at in our company and what in our in our firm and, and the learnings and trainings that we're putting in place that really do um, start to tease this out. As you were just saying, Faith, that leadership training is key, um, I think. But th those are just my two cents. I don't know if anyone else had something they wanted to throw out on that because it's a great question. And make sure I get a make sure I get the registration link to that to that um, webinar, Corey, because that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I don't, we're right at the time. Well, actually, a minute over. So I guess we'll just wrap up. I just wrote down a few key takeaways I wanted to leave um, everyone with. And again, thank you for joining us. Um, but as you, this is a journey. I think you've heard all the panelists say this. You know, this journey to cultural competence requires lifelong learning. It requires self introspection, being self aware. Um, being willing to open yourself up to learn more about other people, other cultures, all of that. So I think, you know, some key take takeaways I wrote down is one, do the work. Uh, take the time to be to, to do that self evaluation, that self inward introspection. Invest the time, meaning, you know, educate yourself. You know, take some time to learn about other cultures, talk to other people, at, be willing to ask the quote unquote silly questions. And then, you know, lastly, be empathetic and, and, and give grace. This is not as as all of them have said, this is not a sprint and you will make mistakes. As leaders, we will fall down, we will say the wrong thing, we will offend. But um, you know, be be willing to admit those things and, and extend grace to others just like you're asking them to extend to you. Um, and then lastly, just be hopeful, y'all. 2020 is doing the most, as my 19-year-old would say. Uh, you know, so we've got to just stay hopeful. Don't don't buy into this diversity fatigue argument. As Faith said, it took 400 plus years to get us here. We're not going to take 400 years to get out. We we give you that, but it will take time. It will take time. So um, that's it. I just want to thank this amazing panel. Thank you each and every one of you for joining us for this hour. We hope that something said was um, impactful for you, a nugget for you. And again, thank you to Corey and her amazing team and to Safarth Shaw for giving us this opportunity to talk about this uh, very important topic. So enjoy your weekend, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You have to do that virtual wave. <laughs> <laughs>